Good evening and welcome to this evening's show of Navarra Live. My name is Aaron Bastani. Tonight we have a little bit of role reversal. My co-host for this evening is Michael Walker. Michael, how are we? Uh, very well. I always enjoy co-hosting with you, Aaron. Uh, why is that, Michael? Why is that? You want me to... Yeah. Three reasons. Well, I think you're... You, you ask very um, astute questions, let's say. Maybe, maybe, maybe pointed questions. You challenge me. I learned from the best, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, coming up later tonight, Kay Burley comes for Navarra after she misrepresents a Palestinian official. The European Commission rolled back on suspending aid payments to Palestine. And we speak exclusively to an activist from Namod who are holding a vigil in London tonight. Stay tuned for all that. Labour leader Keir Starmer has given his speech to uh, this year's Labour Party conference, but it didn't get off to a perfect start. True democracy oh. is citizen-led. Politics needs an update. We demand a people's house. We demand a people's house. We are in crisis. Thank you. Thank you, conference. If he thinks that bothers me, he doesn't know me. <laughs> Protest or power, that's why we changed our party conference. That's why we changed our party. Thank you. Michael, I do distinctly remember Keir Starmer going on various protests to stop Brexit to have a second referendum in 2019. But what do I know? You were just giggling there to yourself watching all of that. What, what precisely was this gentleman doing? What was he asking for? A people's house, Aaron. You must have heard the cry, the rallying cry for a people's house. I was truly inspired um, by that guy, Fran Glitter on Keir Starmer, and I've joined the campaign for a people's house. I think, mean, what do they want? Proportional representation, which I am in favor of, in fact. Um, but uh, it was a rather obscure way of demanding it. Michael, I've been thinking about this, you know, when he's prime minister, which I think is, looks bolt on certain right now, we need you to go up there, storm up there and go, subscribe to Navarra Media on YouTube. And if you really want to support our work, go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. Uh, that would have been a hell of a lot more useful than what that chap was doing. In any case, he was from a group called People Demand Democracy. They're calling for, quote, a fair proportional voting system for Westminster elections, as well as, quote, a legally binding National House of Citizens selected by Democratic Lottery, sortition. Uh, according to Press Association Media, the demonstrator was bundled out of a back door and immediately taken into a police van and then driven away. With his jacket now off, Starmer soon got going again, laying out his vision of a new contract between politicians and the people. People are looking at us because they want our wounds to heal. And we are the healers. People are looking to us because these challenges require a modern state. And we are the modernizers. People are looking to us because they want to build a new Britain. And we are the builders. But they also look out at the chaos in the world and in Westminster, and they want to know, can we find that elusive path to an economy that serves their community? Can we deliver the rock of stability they need to move forward with their lives? Shelter from the storm and a passage to calmer waters. Because, conference, we should never forget that politics should tread lightly on people's lives. But our job is to shoulder the burden for working people, carry the load, not add to it. It's exactly in moments like this, when people want change, need change, cry out for change, that the hope of the easy answer can prosper. And conference, we cannot be about that. Changing a country, changing a country is not like ticking a box. It's not the click of a mouse. Long-term solutions are not oven ready. If you think our job in 1997 was to rebuild a crumbling public realm, that in 1964 it was to modernize an economy left behind by the pace of technology, that in 1945 to build a new Britain out of the trauma of collective sacrifice, then in 2024, it will have to be all three. 
So not Attlee, not Wilson, not Blair, all three. And to do all that would require a decade of national renewal. Not a single term, but at least two. But while the speech was high on inspiration, it was very light on policy detail. The few areas got special treatment. Starmer pledged to get the NHS back on its feet, promising this. The non-DOM tax status is a legal loophole that allows some of the richest people in the world to avoid paying tax in Britain. That's money we could invest in our NHS. That's always been our priority. And right now, the biggest challenge is cutting waiting lists. So we will invest that money in boosting capacity. We will get the NHS working around the clock and we will pay staff properly to do it. More operations, more appointments, more diagnostic tests. You will be seen more clearly in an NHS clearing the backlog seven days a week. And now we've all heard that promise before regarding non-DOMs, nothing new there. But according to the IFS, scrapping non-DOM status will raise around three billion pounds a year. Meanwhile, Day-to-day -day spending on the NHS last year was around 172 billion. So does Keir Starmer really think that an increase on that budget of less than 2% is going to solve the waiting list problem? And remember, there are presently over, and this is an extraordinary number, 100,000 staff vacancies in the NHS, over 100,000 vacancies, a figure that one think tank predicts could rise to 300,000 by the end of the 2030s as a result of an aging population. We are now 48,000 nurses short in England alone. So is paid overtime really going to sort all of that out? Not according to the Royal College of Nurses, who criticised the policy when it was first mooted on Sunday. What was new on policy was this announcement on house building and the aspiration of home ownership. To have made that aspiration harder for working people, that's been a disaster for our economy and for the unity of this country. So today we launch a new plan to get Britain building again, a signal of our determination to fight the blockers who hold a veto over British aspiration. No more land bankers sitting comfortably on brownfield sites while rents in their communities rise. No more councils refusing to develop a local plan because they prefer the backdoor deal. No more inertia in the face of resistance, and there will be resistance from people who say, no, we don't want Britain's future here. My message to them is this, a future must be built. That is the responsibility of serious government. And if we continually wash our hands of this task, we all end up in a rut, just like now. So it's time to get Britain building again. It's time to build one and a half million new homes across the country. It's time to get Britain building again. Certainly heady rhetoric. To put that pledge in context, in 2019, the Tories pledged to build a million homes across a parliament. They achieved about half of that. Now, Starmer didn't give a time frame in this speech for that one and a half million figure, but elsewhere Labour have said it would be over a single parliament. In other words, five years, meaning 300,000 new homes a year. Uh, this would mean going three times as fast as the Tories ever did. However, no new tools would be available. Beyond the idea that Labour would simply just get tough with developers. Sounds good. Is it really going to triple the number of houses being built? That seems unlikely. What is more, the Centre for Cities estimates that Britain would have to build 440,000 new homes a year for a quarter of a century in order to address the housing crisis. So Labour saying 300,000 for five years, the Centre for Cities is saying 440,000 for at least 25 years. A bit of a gap there. Also, no real mention was made of renters whose problems won't be solved if landlords end up snapping up all those new homes. Michael, I'm going to come to you because I know you care deeply about the housing crisis. What did you make of Keir Starmer's speech on this pledge in particular? They are resting an awful lot on their housing policy because this seems to be the, the, the centrepiece to everything they're offering. Because they're saying we're not going to increase taxes, but we are going to improve public services. And they say they're going to pay for that by getting growth. They're not going to borrow to invest because that would increase debt over the long term. And so their only concrete plan to increase growth seems to be to loosen planning controls and get a bunch of houses built. Now, I'm perfectly fine, actually, with planning reform to get some more houses built. I think it's overdue. Um, what I think is lacking here is the ambition to say we will also build some ourselves. 
So if you look at the history of house building since the Second World War, when we used to build, you know, there were years where we built 400,000 houses a year, but half of those were council homes. So the private sector did half, councils did half. And that way, um, the state can ensure that you will get lots of good houses and they're high quality houses if you invest properly in them. And then the state has this big asset at the end of it. So it makes a lot of sense for me to say we want a mixed model for housing. We're going to invest a bunch. We'll get the private sector to do a bunch as well. Now, Keir Starmer seems to just be hoping that he can get the private sector to do everything. So all of these various things that the Conservatives were unable to get them to do, he is magically going to be able to get them to do. How do you stop them land banking? Not that clear to me. You're going to say, you know, you've got to start building on this within two years of getting planning permission. Possible. Um, I would say that the, these industries are probably then going to say, you know, they'll find some other excuse not to do it, right? I think you really, to have an active state, which I think is kind of what he's talking about, you know, a mission-oriented state, it has to be willing to do some things, right? It can't just tweak the rules and hope the private sector will will solve all their problems. So we've been talking about Section 106, sort of, so council housing via negotiating with developers so that they can, um, you know, have 20% of their building council homes or whatever. So that's what's currently in place. Now, they always use that as an excuse not to build the housing. They say, oh, we can't afford to do it if you're if you're promising, if you're, if you're forcing us um, to put a bunch of council homes in them because obviously we can't sort of uh, turn them into, um, we, we, we can't sell them off for as, as, as high as we would the rest of the building. So they'll say that's working against any planning reform he's doing. So it's not a reason not to do it, but it is a reason to say the state is going to have to do some stuff. And the reason he is hamstrung there is because he says that debt will be falling over the course of the parliament as a proportion of GDP. So he's still, he's, it, nothing has changed, essentially. Nothing has changed. But let's hope he builds shed loads of houses because not only do we need loads more houses, but that is really the only concrete thing he seems to be offering. Yeah, I think on this issue of housing, I, I think there's real limits. I think on, on three big issues, on growth, NHS housing, I don't see very much. And people should be aware of this on the fiscal rule of GDP to debt falling over a parliament. That really does commit Labour to something resembling austerity. Okay, because they say, well, look, we're willing to run deficits if we're going to build infrastructure, like, say, HS2, if they want to do Northern Powerhouse Rail or build council homes. You can do that, right, with those rules. But then the second rule is, like you say, Michael, that has to fall as a percentage of GDP, which means they'll do none of this. So it's it's great. They say, we want to be like 45. We want to be like 64. We want to be like 97. Look at all these immense problems. And the solutions are, eh, not very much. That is an issue. It's good that they recognize the scale, rec they recognize the scale of the problems. That's really good. That's progress from the Labour Party before Corbyn. It's definitely not what the Tories are doing, but the solutions are incredibly meager. There was another place where Starmer sets himself far apart from the Tories, however, and that was on the issue of climate change. Clean British energy is cheaper than foreign fossil fuels. That means cheaper bills for every family in the country. The conference, also a chance to make us more competitive. Countries like America are using this gift to create manufacturing jobs the like of which we haven't seen for decades. And they're not the only ones. So when Rishi Sunak says, row back on our climate mission, I say, speed ahead. <laughs> speed ahead with investment. Speed ahead with half a million jobs. Speed ahead with great British energy. A new energy company that will harness clean British power for good British jobs. A company that will be publicly owned conference and we will boast in Scotland. Overall, the speech didn't really contain very much that was new. But with Labour so far ahead in the polls, maybe fresh policy announcements at this stage are seen as too risky. Instead, Keir Starmer focused on character, stressing his working class roots rather than the middle class reality, and speaking empathetically about the difficulties working people have faced during COVID and the cost of living crisis, all while letting corporations know that Britain is open for business. It's a tough balancing act to get both of those on side, but he's doing pretty well. Michael, we've discussed housing already. What did you make of the rest of the speech? I think it was a pitch to business more than anyone else. You know, like he he, he kind of did. You know, the, the rhetoric was fine. I think the idea of sort of uniting the 1945 and the 1964 and the 1997 governments makes sense. I mean, Britain is facing all of those challenges. I think that was somewhat smart. But in terms of policy, I mean, I've never seen someone announce 
a policy which is going to raise three billion pounds a year so many times, right? Three, as you've said, Aaron, three billion pounds a year. So I'm talking about the you know, closing the the non dom loophole. Now that's I, I can see how that's reasonable electoral politics, right? Because if you repeat it over and over and over again, you know, we watch politics closely, so we're bored of that announcement. But you have to repeat something a lot of the times before the public remember it, and they're hoping the public will remember that, and it works electorally because one. Um, it's it's not that threatening to business, it's marginal. Um, but two, it makes it look like you are going to stand up to the rich. The problem with it is it only raises, as we keep saying, three billion pounds a year. So, I mean, I think this is probably the big story of this Labour Party conference, which is that Labour are wrapping up business, right? Mark Carney speaking in favour, endorsing Rachel Reeves, right? So someone who is the, the top of the sort of business establishment, headhunted by George Osborne. You've got business leaders sort of now piling in to support the Labour Party. And essentially what you had, in this speech was Keir Starmer once again, standing up and speaking for a very long time and not mentioning how he was going to make life tougher for the rich and the wealthy, right? He's basically saying, we are going to bring about growth by being more competent managers and by loosening planning rules when it comes to building. Now, as I say, that doesn't quite add up if you're looking for an ambitious program, if you're going to achieve all the things he says he wants to achieve. But if I was sitting there as a business leader watching, I'd think, this guy really is a safe pair of hands. I think that's right. I think that's dead right. Just quickly, before we move on to the next story, you know, they're talking about the uh, private schools uh, having to pay VAT, although how that is operationalized seems very ambiguous at the moment. Initially, they were saying that would save 2 billion. I think the IFS have said it will save, you know, it will raise rather 1.3 billion. Okay, 1.3 billion. Non-DOMs, 3 billion. That's 4.3 billion pounds a year. Okay, that's good. We like that. But that's not going to pay for Green Prosperity Fund, uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail, uh, you know, um, getting rid of the two-child benefit cap, you know, 101 other things that Labour re realistically needs to do. Stuff on universal credit, uh, reversing massive, massive, massive austerity imposed on local government over the last 13 years. Very much needed pay rise in the public sector, particularly with junior doctors, nurses, teachers. You know, that's not going to stop anytime soon. So I just think... There's such a gulf, Michael, between what he's, again, he's isolating the problems perfectly well, um, which is new for Labour. Pre-Corbyn, they weren't doing that. Um, look, they thought austerity was necessary for Christ's sake. He's isolating the problems. Uh, he's talking about some of the kind of necessary solutions that would help. But then where is the money coming from? You know, when I see the Financial Times saying, oh, the Green Prosperity Fund, it'll be £28 billion pounds a year. They're saying it's going to have to come from growth. Where from? Changing planning regulations. Oh, because we've got stability. You know, we've had a productivity crisis in this country. So productivity output per person, per hour worked, has barely gone up for 15 years. Keir Starmer is basically saying, when I'm prime minister, it will magically go up because of stability. I mean, maybe, maybe everybody's wrong. And actually the missing ingredient for the productivity puzzle in this country since 2008 was Keir Starmer. Who knew? If only we'd got there sooner. I suspect it won't be that simple. Let's see. Uh, let me know your thoughts as well, of course, using the hashtag Navarro Live and on the Super Chat function. I know that sometimes we talk about these things. People say, you're going to so parcel with care. Don't do that. Get the Tories out. I, I agree. But it's very, very important to dissect the policies being talked about and how they're funded. Because if you can't fund them, they don't happen. The attacks by Hamas on Israeli civilians have killed over 900 people. And they were quickly followed by the bombing and blockade of Gaza by Israeli forces. One of the most densely populated areas on Earth. It's home to nearly two and a half million people, half of which are children. They're now being actively starved of water, food, fuel, and electricity. Entire neighborhoods are being flattened by rockets fired across the border from Israel, with no distinction being made between Hamas fighters and civilians. Nearly 800 people have died in Gaza so far, and 4,000 are injured. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to reduce the territory to rubble. In response to the escalating war, protesters gathered outside of the Israeli embassy in London to express solidarity with Palestinians and demand an end to the occupation. There were around 2,000 demonstrators at that protest yesterday evening, and it was largely peaceful. The police made just three arrests. And yet Foreign Secretary James Cleverly had this message for those who attended. Your colleague yesterday, who was out here, communities minister, said these people should stay at home. What would you say? Well, there's no, there is no need, there is no necessity 
uh, for people to uh, to come out. It causes it causes distress. So there is no there is no need but for stay this. At home. So I would be you know I would suggest that they do. There is no requirement for this. This is a a difficult and delicate situation, and uh, increasing um, fear and and these protests be under no illusion are causing a huge amount of distress for people in the Jewish community in the UK who have often been at the receiving end of prejudice and threats of violence. There's no need for this at all. And I would encourage them just to, uh, to, just to pause. This is a, a, a delicate and difficult situation and this isn't helping. It's important to say it's good that he's employing some diplomatic language there, Mr. Cleverly, the, the Foreign Secretary. But he also did say the day before that effectively the Israelis have carte blanche with regards to whatever they want to do in response to the Hamas attack. That's why people were protesting. There's a blockade, a siege, frankly, of two and a half million people in Gaza. No electricity, no water, no food, no fuel. They can't get out. It's an open-air prison. So that's why people are protesting. I think any sensible person could at least understand why you would protest against that, even if you don't necessarily agree or wouldn't go on such a protest yourself. His Jewish Chronicle editor, Jake Wallace-Simmons, saying his bit too. Heard from the Foreign Secretary uh, this hour saying that demonstrators, uh, Palestinian demonstrators, should stay home. What would you say? I would say that that's good advice. I mean, nobody is denying that the Palestinian uh, supporters uh, have a right to express their views uh, or and have a right to support the Palestinians as a reasonable cause. But I think we need to take stock of what has just happened these past few days. We have seen the acts of the most medieval barbarism meted out on Israeli men, women and children, all of whom are entirely innocent within Israel's internationally recognised boundaries and just going about their daily lives. Uh, these are acts of barbarism, the likes of which, unfortunately, are familiar to Jews from previous centuries from the Holocaust and stretching further back all the way into medieval times. And the fact that people in Britain can react to those atrocities by going out onto the street and waving the Palestinian flag without any thought of the victims or of showing any solidarity with those innocent lives lost is really despicable. What do you make of that, Michael? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I, I personally understand entirely why somebody would protest the siege of 2.5 million people. But at the same time, if you're trying to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's, who's critical of Palestinian rights activists, who is skeptical of their good intentions for whatever reason, I mean, it, it, they would say they're celebrating the deaths of you know, hundreds of people, maybe as many as a thousand people, which obviously I would argue the, the, that basically nobody's doing that. Virtually nobody's doing that. What, what's your take on this? Because obviously it's a very tense situation um, and people need to tread carefully. I have seen clips as well of people sort of giving speeches, especially there were some speeches in New York, which seemed pretty appalling, actually, sort of the way people talking about, you know, these are just some hipsters at a, a music festival getting slaughtered, right? So, oh, they're just, you know, almost almost making a joke out of it. So I, I, I do think that people do need to stop and think how they will be interpreted when they when they speak and make sure that they don't look like they are cheerleading for a lot of innocent civilians getting killed in quite a brutal manner, right? That That isn't something that people should be cheerleading in the streets. Um, but I think the real danger here is if Palestinian solidarity itself and the waving of the Palestine flag, right? because the, the Palestine flag is not the Hamas flag. Palestine flag is very specific. It's the people of Palestine. So waving that should never, no, there, there is no day where waving that should be inappropriate in my mind. And we are going into a period where, I mean, Israel has already started bombing Gaza in a manner which is you know, totally over and above what we have seen in recent years, in recent decades, they are going to destroy, to level that incredibly densely populated um, country or place or part of Palestine, depending on how we want to refer to it, right? And they're putting it under siege. And we've got, you know, British politicians saying, oh, yeah, they're, they're cutting off the water. Well, they have a right to defend themselves. So this is an incredibly dangerous time for Palestinians. And uh, that, to me, means it's incredibly dangerous and actually morally very despicable, really, to say that the act of waving a Palestinian flag on a protest is itself problematic. Because if you know that there are two million people living in a densely populated open air prison who are having the siege which they've been under for years intensified and are about to be bombed fairly indiscriminately, 
right? Lots of tower blocks going down. I know Israel will say, well, there's, there's Hamas there, but you're going to kill a lot of civilians if you, if you sort of bomb a place as densely populated as that. Um, people don't have anyone to go, right? So it, if in that situation, you can't raise a Palestinian flag outside an embassy, the embassy that's doing the bombing, then I think we have a real problem. Now, that's not to say there haven't been things said either online or at demonstrations, which I do think are problematic, wrong. Um, and I can totally see why Jewish people would be very upset by them. I, I, I totally understand that. But I think we're moving into very, very dangerous territory if we delegitimize Palestinian solidarity when it's actually, you know, one of the their greatest times of, of need for it. Yeah, and I think there's been a general elision between Hamas and Palestine, the political entity of Hamas, uh, and and like I said, the, the Palestinian flag is seen as the H Hamas flag. People say, oh, they voted for Hamas. They The last time there were elections... Uh, involving Hamas, uh, I think in the West Bank, um, was, was 17 years ago, Michael. You know, so it's a very sort of misrepresentative way of proceeding. Uh, as well as all that, there was LBC's Ben Kentish who posted this. Can you imagine if two days after the Bataclan attack, of course, the terrorist attack in Paris a few years ago, thousands of people in London had gone to protest outside the French embassy? No, you can't. And I suppose the point here is, well, no, of course you can't, but if they had then proceeded to invade Algeria, I mean, you probably would, right? The IRA did many attacks on, on, in Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland, and the, and the British mainland. Um, that didn't therefore lead to the British army, well, there was an occupation at the time, but it didn't lead to tit-for-tat reprisals where they'd go into Republican areas and, and, and murder hundreds of people. That, that didn't happen, which is now effectively happening in, in, in Palestine. So that's actually quite a good example, isn't it? And, and that's precisely what Britain did not do. Uh, while people were demonstrating in support of Palestine, a vigil was also taking place outside Westminster, where Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis said this. On one side, it is a war against civilians. Every man, woman and child, innocent civilians are on the front line of this war. And as far as Israel is concerned, all Israel wants to do is to protect our civilians, to attack those murderers wherever they might be. No civilized person cannot be moved, cannot be deeply shocked by the scenes of brutal terrorist outrage in Israel. This evening, another vigil will take place in Hyde Park. This one is organized by Nahmod, a movement of British Jews seeking to end Israel's occupation of Palestine. The vigil will mourn both Palestinian and Israeli citizens killed, as well as call for the end of the Israeli occupation. Earlier today, I spoke to Marco, an activist with Namot. We've been campaigning for many years. Um, and I think after the events of this weekend, which were so tragic and full of grief for, for many in our community, we thought that the first thing we needed to do was gather and offer a space to mourn and to reflect on, on what's happened and to provide a space where we are able to condemn the crimes that um, Hamas militants committed, uh, but also commit, uh, condemn the, the system that allowed those crimes to happen, um, which is the occupation and apartheid that have been going on for the past 40 years, uh, which is a space that in our community, sadly, uh, we are the only ones to really provide. Marco, I understand that you have friends and family members in, in the regions affected in Israel. Can you detail that a little bit, please? So I, I grew up in Belgium um, in the Jewish community. And then, like, like many Jews, I, I spent uh, a few months in a kibbutz in Israel um, after high school. I spent uh, that time in a kibbutz called Cholit, which was three kilometers away from the Gaza Strip. Um, and on Saturday, um, this kibbutz was... Um, taken over by uh, Hamas militants and a few of the people I'd met there uh, were unfortunately, ki unfortunately killed. Many of the houses and the infrastructure was burned. Um, and, um, and then also I think a lot of the friends I met there, uh, when I kind of scroll through my Facebook feed, um, I see their loss and the fact that they've lost friends and family and, and that many of them are, are still looking for their friends and family that have been taken captive. And so really the last few days have been pretty distressing for me and, and my family. Um, yeah. I'm sorry to hear about that. 
What's your sense of those who've been affected? What What do those at the heart of all this want? How do they feel? Who are they blaming besides, obviously, Hamas? Yeah, I think from what I've seen, uh, Israelis that have been affected, I think there is some anger, uh, definitely, as you say, as, at Hamas, but also uh, um, the Israeli army not having been uh, present and, and reactive enough, uh, the lack of intelligence. Um, and I think for those of, of my comrades kind of on the Israeli left, I think a lot of it is also pointing to the fact that a lot of the security forces uh, that were meant to protect those communities were mobilized in entrenching occupation and protecting settlers in the West Bank. And that's why they weren't uh, able to protect communities in, in the south of Israel, which uh, are communities that have been historically marginalized and kind of poorer communities that have been put there um, by, by the state of Israel uh, as a kind of line of defense. So I think that that's, you know, the, the anger at the army, the anger also, I think, was at the, the Israeli state infrastructure that didn't provide um, <clears throat> much support to the families uh, of the of those that were taken captive. Uh, they had to kind of go through an ordeal to to find the whereabouts of their of their relatives. But I think the, the overwhelming majority of the Israeli public uh, is in support of uh, a strong um uh, uh, military response uh, against Hamas, uh, but I think there are many voices now on on the Israeli progressive side that uh, are calling for uh, a ceasefire, an exchange of prisoners uh, uh, instead of of an escalation. Uh, and I think those voices have also been like there's been some of those voices on on Israeli TV as well. For example, one of the fathers of of one of the people that had been taken captive uh, voiced that opinion, which I thought was. Uh, a, a kind of glimmer of hope in 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 what seems to be a a narrative that is pushing towards more and more war crimes and an entrenchment of of um of a bad situation. And what do you make of the response by Israel going forward? Uh, obviously, a lot of that so far is rhetorical. But when Netanyahu says that the actions that will be undertaken in the days ahead will be remembered by Palestinians for for generations, uh, how does that make you feel? And and and. Does that make you concerned? Definitely. Um, yeah, I think for me, living in that kibbutz uh, and kind of suffering through having to go through bomb shelters because of of, uh, of kind of uh, missiles approaching the kibbutz, I think for me it was a, a big wake up call in realizing that there wouldn't be a, a solution to this this reality. If, if there had if there, if there is no peace agreement and and kind of freedom and equality for everybody in the region so I think the escalation and the idea that by destroying Hamas uh, suddenly the Palestinian population will no longer have a grievance against the occupation and apartheid that that's um, th that has been ruling their lives for the past decades is complete fantasy uh, they might destroy the Hamas infrastructure this time but Palestinian resistance to their occupiers will continue. Um, and so I think the only solution to this reality is really one of, of shared uh, uh, equality and freedom for everyone. Substantially then, what, what should happen now? Because obviously you're saying that might is right isn't the best approach here, that there needs to be an extension of law and human rights to, to, to Palestinians and an end to apartheid. At the same time, Something absolutely catastrophic and awful has happened to Israelis. So, what would you propose happen over the next couple of months, the next year? Our movement is is about um, thinking about a shared future of, of freedom and equality, and we're we're not proposing uh, specific solutions. But in my mind, the the best course of action would be uh, to call for a ceasefire and an exchange of prisoners. Uh, which would allow for the ceasefire and would reduce the amount of, of civilian casualties. Um, and then after that, to actually negotiate with uh, Hamas and, and uh, dismantle the system of occupation that has been existing over the past decades and trying to ensure that through a process of peace building and reconciliation, uh, a, future, a just future for all could be established.
That was Marco speaking on behalf of Namod ahead of their vigil this evening. Let's get to some of your questions and your super chats. Thanks to Ashton Dowling, who's given us £10, their first ever super chat. Uh, and also Ahmed, who's given £5 on super chat and said this, Navarro Media is on fire this week. Put your money where your mouth is and support them. We need more of this. Thank you so much, Ahmed. It was really brought home to me, actually, at Labour Party conference. You know, there's going to be a general election next year. And I think Navarro Media is going to be massive. Massive, massive, massive. We get about half a million views a day on our YouTube channel. Uh, and I think during a general election campaign with our daily show, our interviews and all our, our other content too, I think we'll be getting millions of views a day on our YouTube channel. Uh, and I think that will help to shift the debate in this country in a better way. I think it will hold uh, some of the billionaire media in this country actually accountable and keep them scrutinized and in, in some sense, hopefully honest. We've got a story about that in a moment. Uh, but help us do that by going to nevaramedia.com forward slash support, helping us build people-powered media. We've come so far, and honestly, I think we're most of the way there. It's creating a national media outlet in this country, yes, with left-wing values, but also real commitment to the truth, to honesty. Uh, and, and really, we're not staffed by people who want to go and work for Labour or, you know, for the Times People at Navarra want to stay here and build something new, different, and distinct. Help us do that. Go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. I think the link is in the description. In the aftermath of the attacks by Hamas on Israeli civilians, the EU decides to take decisive action. The bloc announced that it would suspend all funding to Palestine, essentially drawing a connection between Hamas and all Palestinians currently under Israeli occupation. The move followed Austria and Germany's individual decisions to cut off their own funding to Palestine. This is how EU Enlargement Commissioner Oliver Varelli justified the decision to hold back 690 million euros. The foundations for peace, tolerance and coexistence must now be addressed. Incitement to hatred, violence and glorification of terror have poisoned the minds of too many. We need action and we need it now. Well, it turns out some members of the European Union weren't happy with what looks like a unilateral decision. Acting Deputy Prime Minister of Spain, Yolanda Diaz, said this, This decision is outrageous. It's an authentic betrayal by Europe of its own founding principles. The European Commission must rectify and Europe must lead an international action for peace, not punish an entire people. Ireland's government objected to saying this, we have seen the tweets issued this afternoon by Commissioner Varehi. Our understanding is that there is no legal basis for a unilateral decision of this kind by an individual commissioner, and we do not expect a suspension of aid. The Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutter, also disagreed with the commissioner's decision. He said this, We really have to make the distinction between Hamas, the terror organization, and very innocent Palestinians who are just as much victims right now, and again, in the case of Gaza, have been for 16 years, which is when there was last an election there, and have to live under the yoke of a terrible terrorist regime. Also chipping in was Luxembourg, whose acting foreign minister said the country did not support blocks to Palestinian aid. Lo and behold, just a few hours later, the EU was forced to backtrack with its crisis management commissioner announcing a review rather than a halt to aid, saying this. While I most strongly condemn the terrorist attack by Hamas, it is imperative to protect civilians. EU humanitarian aid to Palestinians in need will continue as long as needed. Michael, the EU Commission loves centralizing powers, doesn't it? You know, it's one of these wonderful debates we had during Brexit. People said, there's no European super state. Brussels isn't trying to accumulate as much power as it wants. Often what happens is actually the policy precedes the action, right? So what you, you see here is a kind of ad hoc response by one commissioner seemingly overstepping the mark. And in this instance, actually, people have pushed back on it and said, well, actually, no, that's not congruent with our foreign policy interests, what we want, what our electorates want. Well, I mean, I suppose in terms of the, the centralizing force of the European Union, this could be an example of the opposite, right? It was some commissioner who sort of went over and above um, his, his his abilities and it got blocked by a few states. Reminded me actually of your interview with Yanis Varoufakis, where he's talking about you know, the EU isn't a superpower because who's going to be in the room being taken seriously? It was Merkel. Now no one can be taken seriously, especially as they know that, you know, depending on the issue, there are various states that will, will block any kind of decisive action. What this made me think, though, is... You know, I feel like the reason that commissioner thought he could get away with it is because, you know, lots of people are looking at this like this sort of 9-11 moment, right? And, and like 9-11, it was incredibly tragic and lots of 
civilians have, uh, have been killed and we should be very very concerned about that right it's it's no no one's saying that these huge terrorist attacks are not a bad thing or terrorist attacks or war crimes however we want to to describe this but the killing of lots of civilians is a very very bad thing right but the reaction should not be to say okay all due process goes out the window okay um yeah normally we sort of say oh you shouldn't do collective punishment or you shouldn't turn off the water to two million people or you shouldn't withdraw aid to um, a whole, again, to 2 million people because of the actions of some militants, right? That would normally be what you do. But there's this sort of drive in politics to say, because a horrific event has happened, everything else has to go out the window. Forget about the consequences. Forget about the, the pain and suffering we will cause. Now, look back to 9-11. That is what happened. And what did it result in? It resulted in two catastrophic wars right? Afghanistan and Iraq. Back then as well, people who criticize that, you'd say you're a terrorist sympathizer, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, sometimes it's good to take a step back, right? And to think, what are the consequences of the decision we're, we're making? We shouldn't be virtue signaling by just supporting any kind of, of action, whatever the consequences, because we think that makes us on the right side of history because that attack was bad. And so therefore we have to agree with everyone um, who was on the other side of that attack. To, to have the European Union essentially sort of line up behind the most far-right government that Israel has ever had, right? Regardless of how horrific those attacks were, this is the most far-right government that Israel has ever had. You've got them talking about Gazans as if they're animals, right? You, you, you've got them warning Gazans to, to leave somewhere they can't leave. To have European commissioners basically line up behind their narrative to say, all Gazans are guilty, we're cutting off their aid just as, as they're cutting off their, uh, their water, just as the Israeli government are cutting off their water. Thank God there are some adults in the room right, the Irish, the Spanish, the Dutch, who've sort of said, actually, you know, while we condemn the attack, we also probably do need to have some due process. Oh, we also shouldn't sort of get behind this collective punishment that the incredibly far-right Israeli government is doing. So thank God for those people taking a step back. And I, I really do think there are some people, or many people right now, who really need to get a grip, right? Because there are lots of people who say, it's so awful what has happened that all of our concerns uh, have to go out the window. We just have to be 100% behind Israel. We're, we're projecting their flag on the wall. Anything the government wants, we'll say yes. They have a right to protect themselves. This is not the time to encourage restraint. This is exactly the time to, to encourage restraint. And I, I really think a lot of politicians in Europe, in the United States, need to grow up. Yeah, I think the, the comparison, the analogy to 9-11 is perfect. Obviously, what happens on September 11th is horrific. Many innocent people die. But what happened next was not in the interests of American people. Invading Afghanistan, Iraq for 20 years, with all the, the lives lost as a result, all the money spent, did that make America any safer? Not especially. It probably created the, the, the conditions for the rise of ISIS. So I think you're right, Michael. I think people shouldn't act in haste here. And when you do look at the government of Israel, um, you have, I think, two parties in it who don't even stand women candidates. It is the most right-wing government in the history of that country since 1948. Uh, and of course, that needs to be tempered. Of course, it needs to be tempered. 40% of the population of Gaza is under uh, 14. Okay, so you cut aid. Obviously, economically, it's been hammered. You're going to turn it into a, a desolate, barren wasteland by the time that Netanyahu is finished with it in a few weeks' time. W what, kind, what kind of consequences do people think that has? Every tower that is demolished Every bomb that is dropped is a recruiting sergeant for Hamas. This is not making Israel any safer if you just let the most far-right elements of the Israeli government storm in and do what they want, do what they please, and, and no questions are asked. does not make Israeli safer. My God, we've had a might is right approach from Netanyahu for decades. If it was making Israeli safer, how have the events of last week just happened? Surely that's the proof this is precisely not the way to proceed, which is, of course, something that was said earlier on by a representative from Namod. Hussam Zomlot is Palestine's ambassador to the UK. He's an accomplished media performer and regularly appears in news studios whenever Israel-Palestine becomes an issue the British media wants to talk about. Speaking to Kirsty Walk on Newsnight, he opened up about how retaliation measures by Israel to the recent attack by Hamas had impacted members of his own family. There's more than 800 dead in Gaza, including members of your own extended family. What, do you know what happened to them? They were just sitting at their home and they were simply bombarded. Their entire building was brought down. 
Uh, my cousin, uh, Aya, her two children, her husband, her uh, mother-in-law, and two other uh, relatives uh, died immediately, were killed instantly. And two of her youngest children, uh, a twin, two years old, are now in intensive uh, care. This is uh, truly uh, heartbreaking. And the issue here, uh, Kirsty, is that they have no bankers, they have no Iron Dome, they have nowhere to go. They are simply sitting ducks for the Israeli war machine. I'm sorry for your own personal loss. I mean, can I just be clear, though, you cannot condone the killing of civilians in Israel, can you, nor the kidnapping no, families? Condone. No, we don't condone. And we are very clear, uh, 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 Kirsty. We reject uh, any targeting or harming of civilians from all sides. And you are talking to a Palestinian representative, official, the ambassador that I represent my government, the PLO, the national okay. movement of Palestine. And we have been committed to this for 30 years, not just today or yesterday. For 30 years, since the signing of the Oslo Accords, uh, we have committed to non-violence. We have committed to negotiations, so you, as you know. Yes, and so this so is you, nothing new. That's no. why this question, this question, uh, we have done everything in our power to find a different path. Just extraordinary. That was an extraordinary interview. You have uh, a gentleman saying he's lost six members of his family. I think two other children have been hospitalized. And within seconds, Kirsty Walker is asking for him to condemn Hamas. Of course, he does that. He says the position of the people that he represents is not the same as that of Hamas. Again, to repeat, not all Palestinians are supporters of Hamas. Uh, Michael, it really makes you think, doesn't it? Th these people, uh, often in the media, they don't seem to view Arabs particularly Palestinians, as even human. Yeah, I mean, first of all, you know, we should say solidarity to Hussam Zomlot for his loss. I've interviewed him before. We, we show clips of him a lot. Incredibly articulate person, incredibly articulate defender of Palestinian rights. When I first saw people on Twitter discussing this, you know, my first thing was to think, well, you know, he, he, he has had a loss, but he is also the Palestinian ambassador, right? So he is a political interviewee. Um, Kirsty Walk, if she felt like she had to ask that at some point in the interview, you know, she's not going to completely transform her interview because he, he's, he's he's told her about a personal loss. But I, watching the clip, right, the fact that it was immediately afterwards, I'm so sorry for your loss. Oh, by the way, do you condemn Hamas? It was just not right, right? I I, I really do think that was appalling. And you know, we do have this issue when it comes to condemnation. So everyone is asked to condemn. Um, Hamas's war crimes, essentially, so deliberately targeting civilians. That's a war crime, right? But how often do you see an Israeli ambassador or anyone sort of speaking um, in defense of the Israeli side said, do you condemn the collective punishment of the people of Gaza, right? Do you condemn turning off the war to 2 million people as if they are all guilty of a uh, brutal war crime committed by some people in a militia, right? And it is always put on the Palestinians. And yes, I, I think it's OK to ask a Palestinian ambassador that question, as I think it should be um, a moral obligation you know, to ask uh, an Israeli ambassador about whether or not it is a war crime for them to be cutting off people's water, because the ambassador is you know, actually connected to the government doing that. Hassan Zamlot is not actually connected to Hamas, who are committing these, because he is, as you say, um, the ambassador for the Palestinian Authority, a separate entity, or for the Palestinian Liberation Organization. But not only to ask the question, but to do it immediately after someone has told you about six of their family dying. You know, there are follow-up questions you can ask to that. Oh God, you, you can say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that loss. This must be what lots of people in, in Palestine are, are, are worrying about at the moment. You, know, you can ask a question which is relevant to that story. Right? That, that is the, the adult, human, compassionate thing to do. Now, was that a blip by Kirsty Walk? I don't know. Or was the root of that that she sort of dehumanizes Palestinian interviewees? Maybe we, maybe we will never know. But clearly something has gone wrong there. I mean, for me, it just gets to the heart of actually how the media treats people from West Asia and Central Asia, Iranians, Afghans, Arabs. I mean, it seems quite obvious to me they just regard them as less human. Maybe, I, maybe I'm taking it personally because I've got Iranian heritage, but that's just how it seems to me. You know, if somebody was saying, um, like say an Israeli ambassador or Israeli diplomat or, or just a media figurehead or politician said, I've just lost six relatives... I think any sensible person would say that's awful, that's a tragedy. No sensible person would immediately say, well, do you, do you condemn the Netanyahu government or, like you say, collect a punishment? I, I think the manner in which that was conducted, and as you've highlighted there, Michael, the fact that it wouldn't be asked to the other side is really key. And there's not what about three. You know, it gets the heart of the problem here, which is that we repeatedly humanize this one side. And, and that does not help. It doesn't help foreign policy, doesn't help the situation, certainly doesn't help journalists in, get, in getting the accuracy of the facts 
conveyed to the wider public. The Labour Friends of Palestine are due to run an event at Labour Party conference this evening. And appearing at it is Hossam Zomlot, Palestine's ambassador to the UK. Originally, David Lammy was also meant to be in attendance. He's Labour's shadow foreign secretary. He's, however, since pulled out. Now, that event comes after Zomlot disclosed how he lost six family members as Israel retaliated to the surprise attack by Hamas on Saturday. Speaking to Foreign Secretary James Cleverly this morning, Skies at Kay Burley asked if it was appropriate for Mr. Lammy to attend at the same event as Mr. Zamlot. What about your opposite number, David Lammy, sharing a platform uh, with the uh, Palestinian um, ambassador who um, basically said the Israelis had it coming? Well, the, the, those comments, the idea that somehow the... the Would you bo- share a platform with him? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I've met with him. I speak with him. Um, maintaining a, a diplomatic relations is important. Um, but the the point that I've made, and I've made this directly to representatives of the uh, Palestinian Authority, and it's worth remembering. Of course, the Palestinian Authority on the on the West Bank is a is a separate organisation to Hamas. Uh, in, in, in Gaza. So it's important we recognize that. But I have said that, um, that, that, that Palestinian voices, particularly those in leadership positions, should criticize the appalling behavior, the, the atrocious actions that have been perpetrated by uh, Hamas, these indiscriminate killings, these, these murders, these kidnaps, these terrorist uh, actions. Uh, should be condemned by the leadership of the Palestinian Authority because otherwise there will be this perception that all Palestinians support uh, Hamas and they don't and that all Palestinians support this action and I know that they don't. That is an extraordinary clip because James Cleverly is transmitting more information than the journalist, right? He's saying Hamas and the PLO are different people, they have different views, actually they disagree about a great deal. So who basically said the Israelis had it coming? Uh, Kay, you're the journalist, as well as uh, Mr. Cleverly giving facts that you can't. You also can't just attribute quotes like that if you're paraphrasing. It's deeply unprofessional. We'll discuss where those comments apparently came from in a moment. But before we do, let's turn to uh, Kay Burley speaking to another member of the Shadow Front Bench team. That was from this morning with uh, Pat McFadden. Will the Shadow Foreign Secretary sit with the Palestinian ambassador appearing with him um, at an event, um, given that the Palestinian ambassador basically said um, the last couple of days that Israel had it coming? I can only tell you about my conference diary, Kay, where I will be joining the Labour Friends of Israel tonight, uh, individual at the conference. Uh, We stood in silence, in solidarity with the people of Israel yesterday uh, at the conference. And our position on this is very, very clear. Uh, This was a completely unwarranted attack uh, to which Israel Israel has the right to respond, uh, to defend itself, to retrieve its people uh, and to use force to do so. Yeah. However, my question remains, I think it's a a reasonable one. The shadow foreign secretary sitting with the Palestinian ambassador to the United Kingdom, who says that basically Israel had it coming. Your party has gone to great lengths to try to mend the fractures, uh, fractures, I should say, um, as far as the Israeli community is concerned. And then your shadow foreign secretary sits with a guy who says they had it coming. Well, they did not have it coming. So, Kay Burley there is saying, Mr. Zumlot is stating the Israelis had it coming. She said it now to more than one politician. But that wasn't the end of Burley's badgering. Is it appropriate that the Shadow Foreign Secretary sits with a man who said what he said? This is a, an atrocious comment by the uh, Palestinian ambassador to the UK, who has been on the programme many times. I have no uh, personal animosity towards him at all. However, saying something like that and then somebody who would like to be our next foreign secretary shares a platform with him. Lots of my viewers watching this morning would think that that is totally unacceptable. You're not going to answer my question, so let me put it in a different way. If David Lammy does share a stage with the Palestinian ambassador to the UK, should he be disciplined? What isn't clear 
is the shadow foreign secretary, if he shares a stage with the Palestinian ambassador to the UK tonight, should he take the opportunity then to criticize him for the comments that he made, which basically were suggesting that um, bloodshed of Israelis, innocent Israelis, civilians in Israel, uh, was um, a byproduct of um, trying to uh, find a two-state solution, for want of a better way of putting it. So Kay Burley repeatedly puts a phrase to Pat McFadden, asking if his colleague finds it acceptable, without actually quoting what he said. She uses the word basically suggesting. She calls the comment atrocious, but she can't actually say what the comment was. Haven't heard before? I, I can't tell you, sorry. Well, you're the journalist making these demands, it should be said. She's making demands of the shadow front bench and of the shadow foreign secretary for this atrocious comment. She doesn't know what it was. She can't tell you. And next up for Burley was Labour's Stella Creasy. Where are we with the foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary at the moment, um, sharing a stage with a man who has said uh, Israel had it coming? Uh, let's start with you, Stella. I'm not aware of the incident that you're talking about. I know that the Labour Party is absolutely united in condemning the violence, horrified by what we have seen, uh, desperately concerned about those still missing in Israel and Gaza, and also determined that the leadership of both Israel and Palestine needs to come together and show restraint, but also uh, look at what we can finally do to resolve the issues. But I haven't any indication other than that the Labour Party is absolutely united in its condemnation of this horrific violence that we're seeing. I mean, your previous report said it all, really. Uh, given that, uh, Bell, should the Shadow Foreign Secretary be sharing the stage with a man who said, um, the, uh, the Palestinian ambassador to the UK, who said that Israel had it coming? Um, as Stella said, I have, I have no idea as to whether or not uh, this, this is actually going to happen. Um, and I'm not clear under the circumstances under which, under which he would. Um, but I think it's best you probably speak to, to David Lamy about that. Here we've got multiple things here. Who said, who basically said, suggesting that. She said this now to four different politicians from two different parties. She still hasn't said the actual quote. So where did it come from, this apparent atrocious quote. After all, an anchor on Sky News is repeatedly raising it and using it as a line of attack against multiple opposition MPs. Well, we did some digging here at Navarra Media. It's what we do best. And it appears to come from this interview between Christine Amanpour and Mr. Zumlot on Saturday evening. First and foremost, do you condemn what Hamas did inside Israel to Israeli civilians? There are dead and there are hostages. First and foremost, the Western media must really abandon this framework that has gotten us to where we are today. Okay, but I just want to know, it do is, you support is, the killing is, of it civilians? Is, it is, of course not, of course okay. not, of course not. So do you condemn not. that? This, uh, the loss of civilian life is tragic in all sides. And what is happening is extremely worrying and very tragic. And uh, as we speak, the loss of lives, you've counted 70 Israeli deaths. There is more than 200 Palestinian deaths so far, more than 1,600. Entire, entire residential compounds are being wiped out. This is a war crime committed by Israel. What is more tragic, or equally tragic, is the blindness and the deafness of the world and the international community for so many years. Of the warnings we have been saying that this was coming. Israel knew that this was coming their, their, their way. Israel knew this was coming their way. That is categorically different to saying Israel had it coming, particularly after Zumlot has just condemned moments earlier what has happened and referred to both sides and, and, and the events of the last week as worrying and, quote, very tragic. Did Miss Burley even watch this clip? Does she even know where he apparently said this atrocious thing, which she spent all morning talking to politicians about? Or was it just conjured out of nowhere by some researcher who didn't actually check what they were watching? Well, let's go back to that clip because it really underscores how Mr. Zumlot is a sensible man committed to peace through a political process. We, the National Movement of Palestine, the PLO, have found a different path 30 years ago. We have committed to what the world asks us, recognize Israel, commit to negotiations and nonviolence, and to international legitimacy and resolution. Israel was expected to do one thing only, 
roll back its occupation, stop its colonial settlement expansion. Not one day it did so, killing the, prospect, the prospects of a two-state solution. And the world was expected to do one thing, Christian, uphold international law equally on everybody, on Ukraine, on Palestine, and the world fails to do that. So now no what? accountability. Now, every single political avenue is blocked, every single legal avenue for us is blocked, like the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. You've heard what the U.S. said, yeah, or the yeah, U.K. Yeah, but, said. But I want to know what happens so, now. What happens now? It's There's a, a consequence. war it's that a Israel has declared it's, after Palestinian militants, who I don't think your friends, Hamas is not a supporter of the Palestinian Authority. There's a war. And you, as you say, there's going to be a massive escalation. There, there is a war. You see, we're having this conversation because Israelis have seen what they have seen today. But my people see this every day. Every single day, Palestinians are targeted, killed, arrested, rounded, their land is confiscated, their holy places are desecrated, not only Muslims but Christians, you have been following what is happening in the Al-Aqsa Mosque and in our uh, uh, Christian uh, churches, the spitting on uh, Christian worshippers, our people have been seeing apartheid being enforced on them over the last years and the land is being taken and the hope for a political solution that will fulfill their rights dissipating and therefore this is what we need to discuss. Crazy right? Sky News versus CNN. Who do you think is doing journalism better? Michael, what does it say about the British media, particularly Sky News, that they think they can lie and misrepresent somebody so easily um, in this regard? I think it's completely disgusting. I think Kay Burley's behavior all morning was completely disgusting. I said this on Twitter. What it reminds me of is, is a child in a playground who is going up to someone and said, oh, they said you're ugly. What do you think? What do you say back to them? And then they get them to say something nasty. It's made up, right? And, and you were trying to confect a controversy out of nothing and about something so important, right? So there are lives at stake. Israel knew this was coming their way. What does that mean? That means this could have been predicted, right? We have been saying that if Israel keeps oppressing people, giving them no opportunity to sort of uh, pursue any kind of peaceful process, then you will see things like this happen, right? He said they could have seen this coming and it's very regretful that they didn't, right? They had it coming has a very specific meaning. They had it coming means they deserve it. They could have seen this coming does not mean they deserve it. It means this was avoidable. This is tragic. And so for Kay Burley to be standing there and just making up this lie. And uh, what's really disgraceful about it, right? She, she's, she's lying about a human being and a human being who we know um, from a previous story we did on this show has, has lost six members of his extended family in the previous 24 hours. But also she is lying about an entire people because this person is the ambassador of Palestine, to the UK. So when people are watching that, you know, uh, audience members watching that thinking, really, the ambassador for, of Palestine to the UK said the Israelis deserved it. The Israelis had it coming. What is that person going to think about uh, the, the Palestinian people? You know, well, it doesn't sound like they're a very serious people if their ambassador to the UK said Israel had it coming. So she's not just lying about an individual. She's lying about a whole people. And she is trying to confect a controversy where there is none. And I just think it's completely, completely despicable. It is despicable. And you're absolutely right. There's a slander, not just on him. And by the way, I think this, this seems to me like a case of libel. I don't know. It's for a lawyer to judge, but it does seem like a pretty open and shut case. Uh, it's not just a slander on him. It's a slander on an entire people. And it should be said, Mr. Zumlot is a very good advertisement for the Palestinian people. That He's very calm. Um, he's very moderate, you know, uh, very intelligent and very thoughtful. Uh, the complete opposite of too many people in Britain's media. This bizarre story of fake news and misrepresentation didn't end there, because my colleague here at Navarra Media, Michael Walker, pointed this all out on Twitter to Kay Burley. He said this, This is really a terrible journalism from Kay Burley and reminiscent of a playground shitstirrer. You can't just make up provocative quotes and then demand others respond to them. That's exactly what she was doing. It's also especially cowardly, as uh, Mr. Zomlot is exceptional at shutting down this kind of thing when he's being interviewed. It's easier to misrepresent him when he's not there. But then things got really weird as Kay Burley responded with this. Don't message me, Michael. I have no interest in anything you have to say. Then Burley proceeded to write this reply to my other colleague, Ash Sarkar. As you can see here, Ash has written, this is an extraordinary response to a fellow journalist pointing out that you appear to have fabricated a quote from the Palestinian ambassador. She had fabricated a quote. Kay Burley responds with this. Do you not have anything else to do in your Navarra Media office? Off you pop. Well, actually, it turns out 
No, we don't have anything else to do, Kay. That's why we're making this video, exposing your terrible journalism and lies. Strange. Then Kay Burley finally went on to write this about me. So as you can see, I've written here, this is an extraordinary lie of a diplomat and unprofessional in the extreme Kay Burley, utterly shameful, which it is. It completely tarnishes the reputation of British journalism that this even appears and nobody says a peep of the us here at Navarra Media. Kay Burley, stop including me in your messages, Aaron. Thanks. Does she even know what Twitter is? Messages? Eventually, Burley explained this bizarre series of responses to her being called out for making a quote up. Kay Burley, I'm on the train to Liverpool and a bit bored. Have a great day. Very serious stuff there from Sky's most prominent female journalist, I think. Now Adam Bolton's left, the most prominent journalist there. Most puzzling of all is that Burley seems to be demanding Labour don't share a platform with Zumlot when she herself has provided him with a platform on Sky News repeatedly. Here is the Palestinian ambassador appearing on the channel as recently as July this year. The, the U.S. has been really um, rather uh, uh, holding uh, the Palestinian uh, case and issue to one standard and the rest of the world to another standard for a long time. So is the West, by the way. Okay, and it's very unfortunate because international rules and international law is very clear. The U.S. and the rest of the world should really think about these kids that were killed in the last uh, 48 hours. Crazy. Michael, as I said at the top of this story, David Lammy was meant to be at this event, Labour Friends of Palestine event. He then pulled out. I mean, one can assume he, but I think, as, as I understand it, they've not condemned him or anything right now. They're just saying he couldn't make it. You know, it's just trying to avoid any sort of PR problems, which you might not agree with, but it's understandable. But I think that's probably a direct consequence of these lies and this misrepresentation from Kay Burley, isn't it? Because this doesn't seem to me like journalism. It seems to me like political campaigning. It's just trying to make a story where it's not there. It's trying to concoct a story, but with massive political consequences. Yeah. Right. Because obviously what she wanted to do was to have a sort of Labour politician say, oh, you know, David Lammy shouldn't speak with this terrible guy. She, she basically wanted the politicians to repeat what she was saying. Right. Because then it's you, you've created a fact. Right. Because then you have a story. Oh, James cleverly condemns Palestinian ambassador for saying the Israelis had it coming to them. You're, you're trying to concoct a story out of nothing by putting someone on the spot and, you know, with something that's not true. Like it, it, it's incredibly unfair. I would like to see. I, I hope we see an on-screen apology for this. I hope he sues her. I mean, I, I think for anybody who cares about this stuff, please make a, a complaint to Ofcom. Um, people love to say GB News or Navarra Media, you know, the newer outlets, the, how terrible. This is a prime example of unprofessionalism. And the fact that it's being said by somebody who's been in the game for decades, decades and decades. She's been there right from the start of Sky News, I think in what, the early 90s? 30 years. Bizarre. And the response as well. Just, I'm incredulous. That's why, of course, you should support good media with integrity, people powered media that tell you the facts as they are, just like us here at Navarra Media. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining me this evening. A pleasure joining you, Aaron. And thanks to everyone uh, watching me and Michael tonight. This show will be back tomorrow uh, from 6pm. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.